Welcome to episode 11 of the Beef and Bitcoin podcast with your host, Brett and CH. Uh, took a little break from the podcasting. I had some people in from out of town for two or three weeks, really threw off our game. But we are back. Um, not better than ever, but we are we are back. We are back to talk about Bitcoin and everything else that's going on in the world. <clears throat> How you doing, man? Doing good. Um, this, I know we have a pretty good setup today for the podcast and we got a lot of good topics to talk about here um would you, you want to dive in right now yeah let's jump right in so the first thing uh that i wanted to talk about was the delete coinbase movement that went pretty viral over the last 48 hours on twitter uh i made a i made a post about it on instagram i don't know if anybody even saw it but uh it's it's definitely been at the forefront of crypto twitter for sure and, you know, there's a reason for it besides the fact that, you know, we aren't the biggest fans of Coinbase because of a lot of the attacks that they've done on Bitcoin and the space in general. But uh, they acquired Neutrino, which is pretty much a chain analysis firm. And the founders of Neutrino were ex-employees of the hacking team, which, um, you know, directly from their website says... We believe that fighting crime should be easy. We provide effective, easy-to-use, offensive technology to the worldwide law enforcement and intelligence communities. So what they're really saying is we spy on you, track your shit, and then sell that to the authorities uh, you know, to make a profit. That, that's pretty much what they do. So Coinbase has gone ahead and acquired Neutrino, um, and that should be super scary for anybody that's still using Coinbase. Um, you know, if you are still using Coinbase, you might want to check out the Cash App or anything else for that matter, uh, anything. Um, Bitrex, you, or not Bitrex, Bitstamp. <clears throat> yeah. Kraken. Um, I mean, there's a lot of options. You're in. Binance, yeah. I mean, yeah, shit. Yeah. I mean, anything but Coinbase at this point. Pretty <clears throat> much. So, you know, that should be, um, and, and, then it, and then it just started. Everybody said, all right, you know, delete Coinbase movement. And it began. And it's funny because some people are now even having issues deleting their Coinbase account. And they're telling them, oh, you can't you can't delete your account right now. Try back later. Or they have customer service reps on it. So um, it's gotten pr pretty interesting how Coinbase has responded to uh, basically a, a, a half decent amount of people deciding to, to delete their account. Yeah, uh, it's definitely an interesting thing. I mean, obviously, when I was the beginning of the crypto noob, Coinbase is, I think, the second or third exchange I was on, I don't know, something like that. Um, I didn't really use it much ever. I did like GDAX for a little bit because it wasn't a bad way for fiat on-ramp. But um, obviously, <clears throat> with Coinbase's very anti-Bitcoin stance and them just obviously doing a lot of insider trading, like it's so clear every time they list a coin, like we've seen with ZRX, we saw Bitcoin Cash was the most obvious. I can't remember a podcast we discussed, but it did show the build up to, you know, when like Bitcoin Cash got launched, like it was clear people were buying way ahead of time. You look at the volume activity and then, you know, there was a clear little pump ahead of time. And then those people made big bags. I mean, Coinbase or <clears throat> Bitcoin Cash went like, what was it? Like 2000 to 4,000, like just in the, like in the snap of your fingers or something like that, that day. And then obviously it's not seen that sense. And it's now like a hundred bucks. <laughs> I, I almost can't believe that. B cash is below a hundred bucks and it was at literally 4,000. I saw it with my own eyes. I remember, I remember that. it. Yeah. Um, that was so, like peak euphoria. Yeah. I mean, and, but that just goes to show you, this is the kind of stuff that, that Coinbase does. Oh, they, they also, they just listed XRP. So I'd love to know how much <laughs> Ripple Labs had to pay, um, Coinbase to, to list their coin, uh, that I would, very much like to know because I I'm pretty sure Binance gets a pretty hefty listing fee for a lot of the shit coins that they list. So I can't imagine that Coinbase did not benefit greatly from uh, listing XRP, which a lot of people are really happy about. They were calling for it last year. I remember that. And I don't know if it was year end 2017 or 2018, early 2018, I would get the, the XRP army DMing me constantly 
it's going on Coinbase, going on Coinbase, going on Coinbase. And I just, you know, most of them I ignored or, you know, I called them shit coiners or something. And that was kind of the end of it. But it's finally here. They got their wish. And uh, it's not really looking so hot. I think it didn't go the way they expected so far. It's only been, I don't know, two days. But I have no doubt that people with very large XRP bags are extremely happy that there's a few million noobs on Coinbase who are ready to um, <laughs> to buy XRP. It was listed. What day was it listed? Because I'm looking. At the, I mean, it, there was no pump with it, and I think you made a. Little... No, it didn't. It didn't pump. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it, it was. I think it went from thirty one <clears throat> cents down to twenty nine cents, back up to thirty one yeah. cents. I, a... uh, it, I mean, you know, as a per, per, on a percentage basis, I guess that's that's pretty big. Know, it, it's pretty big, but I mean, I think people were getting ready to pump to yeah. the moon, you know, hundred percent move, something like that. Like the whole world was going to sign up for Coinbase and buy XRP because it was finally listed. And, you know, nobody, nobody really cared. It yeah, was, this, that, this was, that no, was kind of it. No December, 2017 Coinbase pump. No, no, it was Wait, not. <clears throat> let's see this three bars, 21 days, 1367%. Yeah. I mean, I remember watching that live. Uh, that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny because that brings me back to the realization that price is what's going to drive adoption, period. I mean, it, and it was, you know, a couple of weeks of just complete mayhem of, I don't know, it seemed like a million new users came into the space in December just because of the price. And that really goes to show me that price definitely does drive adoption. And uh, that, I mean, uh, it's it's great that it's low and we have asymmetric information. You know, we've done our homework. We're trying to learn more about Bitcoin. Um, we're in the middle of a bear market. You can take your time and accumulate some Satoshis and nobody's going to be the wiser. But once we start to move again, then you have to put your seatbelt back on and, uh, you know, be diligent and figure out what you're going to do when a couple million more people jump into the space and have a ton of questions about how to buy Bitcoin. Yeah, no, it's... um. It like and I think we've, we've talked about this before in previous podcasts. <clears throat> Excuse me, but the the like at least and I have a small Instagram account, small following on social media, but I was getting blown up, and like I couldn't even imagine you. You must have been getting so many DMs. I was getting blown up, and I thought you know because it was email, it was DMs, it was text, it was phone calls about crypto, and at like, this point, I was just turning people away. I'm like, if you if you don't understand it, I told them I was like, frankly, don't even fucking touch it. That was actually pretty pretty good advice, because um, it's I, I, looking back, I should have not touched it and done my homework, and that's a mistake that I made. But now I can. That was the whole point, right? That's why this podcast exists. That's why the Instagram page exists. Like I want to help other people learn from those mistakes. Like you really got to sit. It's complicated. It's really complicated. Sound money is not something easy to get. You need to understand. A little bit about computer science. You need to understand enough about Austrian economics. You, you need to understand history and monetary history, and you know why all these crazy things that have happened in our lifetime um, were the result of fiat money. And then you can say, "Oh, all right. Well, maybe Bitcoin has a chance to become sound money, and then it might make sense." But until then, it's it's just a it's gambling. It's like, "Oh, this thing's going up in the thousands of percent. Let's let's jump on board." Yeah, the euphoria. It's it's just the uh, <clears throat> it's simply, you know, uh, greed, hope, and fear cycle. It's every market. Like for instance, when we're looking at candlesticks, all that is is just human psychology painted on the chart here. That's that's yeah, all and, it is. Right, and it's going to be interesting to see how many of these um, like bubbles we see before Bitcoin gets more mature. Uh, you know. I, it, who I, I can't even guess how many more it's going to be, how many more bubbles we see until you see some sort of uh, the decrease in volatility, which volatility technically is decreasing, although it certainly doesn't feel like it when you're watching a $15,000 swing. Um, but <laughs> it, it is what it is. But, it, you know, with the whole delete Coinbase thing, I mean, there's other options out there. Check out Cash App. Um, I have a feeling there's going to be new on ramps in the future. Uh, check out Azteco when you get a chance. They haven't launched yet, but I have a feeling that we, we're going to see something similar to that, that that voucher system to to buy Bitcoin, especially in your convenience stores or bodegas. And it certainly won't start in the United States first. We'll probably get it last, unfortunately. But 
you know, it is what it is. But uh, the whole delete Coinbase movement kind of brings us into the next topic of Facebook coin. And, and Facebook's seen a big delete Facebook movement for pretty much the same thing about them interfering with our privacy, storing all of our information and selling it. I mean, that's that would be the number one reason why you'd want to delete Facebook. And now Facebook is launching their own, apparently. I mean, this is what the news is saying. Facebook, uh, you know, if you look at the headlines, it was headline, you know, the first headline you see from mainstream media is, of course, you know, fake news. Um, Bitcoin's dead. Let's let's close up shot. Um, you know, Wired Magazine says it's dead. Let's, let's move on. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of ridiculous, but looks like they want to launch um, a stable coin and then put that inside of all of their different, uh, their application suite, I guess. So WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook messenger, and you're going to be able to send money back and forth to, uh, anybody that you interact with on these Facebook networks. And that is super scary because now Facebook can access all of your pictures. They can read all of your messages. They have access to your camera and your microphone. And now they can see where you're sending money, who you're sending it to, what are you buying? And they're going to take all of that data, put it into a nice box with a, with a bow on it and sell that to the highest bidder, I would assume. So they have one more piece of information on you now for all of you Facebook users out there. And, uh, (laughs) I don't know, man, what do you think about that? It's interesting. I, I don't trust Facebook at all. And honestly, I, I've came so close to deleting it. I only have it because of uh, I had like a few jujitsu pages or groups I'm part of, but that's literally it. And I so dearly want to delete Facebook. I actually did download all my data off it because I want to know what the hell they had. You can't trust them. I mean, literally Cambridge Analytica scandal from last year proved it. I mean, you can't trust Facebook. It's it's a giant. You are the product of Facebook. That's what people don't understand. You're the product. They use they sell your data. Like it's that simple. Like. Um, and it's also, as you said, the, all the rumored stable coin for WhatsApp, I wouldn't trust shit. WhatsApp is Facebook. They're owned by it. I wouldn't trust anything. Um, as we talk about, like, there's a reason, like people are really focusing on Bitcoin. Obviously we've seen the last year more than ever where that, that focus on Bitcoin is growing. Um, and you're seeing shit coins kind of, you know, falling off left and right. And another thing that I noticed the other day is, the Wall Street exodus from crypto. Remember the inflow of Wall Street people in 2017? Mainly, I mean, there's obviously 2015, 2016, and earlier than that. But the huge inflow was 2017. All these Wall Street gurus come to crypto. They're only coming to crypto because the market was pumping. They have zero clue what they're talking about, most of them. They don't understand the difference between XRP, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin, Litecoin. They couldn't tell you um, anything about them. But what they did know was there was a fuck ton of money to be made. And sure, some did make money. I'm sure a, a lot did lose money. Um, and we're seeing this huge exodus now of Wall Street, which is funny because they came in thinking they were going to become glorious and many of them have not. Yeah, I think it's I I don't remember any exact statistics they were talking about. You know, a number of crypto hedge funds are closing up shop. And uh, I would imagine some of those that saw the pump in 2017, it took them a little bit of time to get set up. And they were most likely, you know, getting into their first positions closer to all time highs for all of the uh, cryptocurrencies that were available for them to to trade. And I, I would be also curious to know how much of them were using margin. And, you know, that's when you need to close up shop. I mean, that's kind of it. Um, I think, you know, these crypto hedge funds. Um, well, here's the thing. So apparently there's rumors that Facebook's been shopping their stable coin around to exchanges. So I'm really curious to see how does, how do you even onboard that? Um, like, like how does it get started? Like, what do you, who's going to be speculating on a, on a stable coin? I guess, first of all, it, apparently it's going to be pegged to like a basket of currencies, um, not just the U S dollar, but you know, a ton of different currencies, which I mean, first of all, that's a bad idea, but, um, I don't know. Like, how do you even onboard users to that? 
system and then get them. If, if you're hoping that people are going to sign up for an exchange in whatever country that they live in and then buy a stable coin and then send it to their WhatsApp wallet, I don't know. It seems like a bit of a stretch. I mean, people, people do it, but you know, the people who are calling for, you know, it's tough because Facebook, you can get a billion users like that. But if you're like, how do you start giving Facebook point away, right? If you're still going to need to force people to buy it on an exchange, uh, I think you're, I think you're not going to like how that ends up turning out. Yeah. I mean, when we like Facebook has a, I'm looking right now, a 463 billion market cap. If they want to get on exchanges, they're going to get on exchanges. Like, it won't take much for them to just dish a couple mil here and there to fucking pump their coin onto these exchanges here. Uh, so that's definitely interesting. Now, the question is, is obviously majority of people, and by majority, I mean 99.9% .9 of human population, is completely naive to crypto and still doesn't really understand it. So if Facebook has this coin and it actually does get on and make some headlines, that's scary. Um, I hope most people are smarter than that to trust of all people, Facebook with their money. I would not, I would never, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it, it is scary because, you know, they have so much power. I mean, $463 billion moves a lot. Like, it's not like if they want to get something done, they're going to be able to get it done. They're a giant corporation. Um, so it is something to be wary of. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they can, uh, this is when it starts to get really interesting, right? We have JPM coin. Now we have Facebook coin. And, you know, I, I'm excited for it to launch almost because I want to see how it plays out. And I really want to see how JPM coin plays out. And I think they're on like a private version of Ethereum. Uh, and somebody had tweeted something earlier about there was a few graphics around how they would use kind of like an interbank settlement system with JPM coin and tying all the banks together. And if other banks are using different blockchains, could you, um, you know, could you have that settlement? And that's pretty much XRP's business model. So, you know, I, I'm really, at first, if you would have asked me a couple months ago, I said, no, we're not going to see banks try to have their own token. I don't think there's going to be a Facebook coin, no Amazon coin, no Alibaba coin, none of that. Now, <laughs> I think they might give it a shot and just see what happens. If they're already, you know, big enough, have enough of, you know, $400 billion market cap, they're not concerned about breaking any laws because the fine's going to be less than how much they're going to make anyway. So maybe, maybe we will see some coins, maybe we, but they're going to be stable coins, which is, that's the way you'd want to do it. Right, I don't want to use XRP if it's going to fluctuate. I'd rather have something that's stable and pegged to the the unit of account that pretty much the globe is using already today. Um, so yeah, they very well could do it, and I I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. I have no idea how long it would take for something like that to break down, and I also don't know if if it's a bullish thing for Bitcoin because it's going to bring more users on to, I don't even, I guess cryptocurrency to have just that aspect of it, even though money's already digital today, just like that, you have that vision of like a token in your mind and it's like on a wallet in your phone. Um, maybe that makes adoption for Bitcoin easier. You can, you can trade in and out. I don't know what that would look like, but um, I also wouldn't recommend it because chances are Facebook is tagging every single one of those coins with your identity and it'll be able to follow those forever and ever. So, um, I personally won't be using Facebook coin or JPM coin probably, but something to keep in mind. Well, probably there. What's going on? Back when mine when I use JPM coin. I have no desire to use JPM coin, but I'm very curious to see how it gets used. Yeah. Because, uh, like, all right. So, you know, I worked in accounting. I've, I've, I've sent ACH payments um, to and from clients. It's a pain. It's not easy. I wish, I, and it has to go through the treasury department. They have to, you know, it, it's a mess. I could see how you, a, like a, a tokenized dollar equivalent that you can click a, bun, a button and send it somewhere else. Yeah, that that's super useful. It's so useful. Um, it's not useful if you still have to deal with the same 
issues and regulations and paperwork and filing and documentation and all that stuff. Like it's still really complicated. So now it's to the point where I almost want to see how that plays out because as much as I think stable coins are a bad idea because a stable coin built on fiat is a shit coin just by definition, because all, all right. Like, you know, all fiat, they're all shit coins. And then there's this digital equivalent of, of one. Uh, so like, it's still you've just added more um, counterparty risk or credit risk, I guess. Like it's just built on, you know, like a built on uh, nothing basically. So, uh, but Tether works, which is kind of weird too. So you, you're you have this trust that Tether has, however many billions sitting in a bank account in Bermuda or wherever else, and uh, you know we've seen swings in Tether, but it's still stayed relatively stable. So. I, I guess it's not possible, but uh, but eventually we know all fiat currencies go to zero. It just depends how long it takes, and uh, we might not outlive that point in seeing their demise. But I just don't see any benefit to adding all the additional risk to creating a stable coin. But it certainly could make things easier for uh, for business reasons and for uh, surveillance reasons, which should be the bigger thing that we're concerned about, rather than that it might be kind of cool. Yeah, it, um, the stablecoin thing is interesting because it's like, at least with a fiat currency like the U.S. dollar or euro, you know, the great thing about it is it's fungible and you can go spend it and use it, you know, areas as paid for gas. There, fiat. It's a great feeling because it's like no one knows who paid for that gas or who used it versus when I use a credit card or something. It's like, okay, my bank now knows where I am, what I'm doing, what I'm spending my money on. Um, and so that's my only thing. Like, that's why I do like cash is the fungibility of it. And that's a huge thing for me. Privacy. So. No, it's important. And uh, I think I, I underestimated cash like years ago. I was like, eh, you know, what, what's the point in keeping cash around? Um, but, but like I, I do get it. It makes a lot more sense to me now. I, I, I have come to appreciate uh, that cash exists and using cash is pretty legit actually. And when it comes to privacy, um, I didn't – I was very much willing to give up my right to privacy for convenience, as I think most people are, unfortunately. And now I'm kind of heading the other direction with that. And uh, privacy is definitely much more important than I had previously realized. And that's why I think we try to talk about it on the podcast as often as we can. And if it's annoying, sorry, but um, it's important. And I think we're seeing more privacy stuff coming to Bitcoin, which is very cool. And it's it's exciting because that's you know, the, one of the best arguments that a shit coiner or someone else will use, well, oh, it's, you know, it's too transparent or it's not private enough. Yeah, you're, you're totally right, man. The blockchain is as transparent as you can get. Um, and we need to work on that. We need to make it much better. And I think things like Wasabi are really dope. More, uh, lightning's way more private than an on-chain transaction, which is fantastic. So it's coming. It's just not here yet. And people want things yesterday. So we, we gotta, we gotta be patient. Yeah, uh, it's it's one of those things where it's just, you know, it's it'll be interesting to see what the next wave of crypto is, what leads it or what catalyst there is. Um, I, I mean, obviously, 2017's crypto rise, the, I, I, one big has obviously is a Bitcoin price crossing that, what was it, $1,400 threshold or whatever, the, or 1200 basically from the 2011 high. And that, um, I remember seeing some people tweet about like, there were some guys who were like, yeah, once once that crossed that line, that $1,200 threshold, they're like, yo, this is a big deal. And that was early 2017. And that was still fairly early. I mean, in terms of price, that was early because if you bought anything in early 2013 or 2017, by December 2018, or at least mid to late December 2018, you're up 10, 20, 50, 100 X, depending on what you bought. And 10 X is not even, not, more like 50 X to be reasonable in terms of USD. I mean, it is insane when you look at some of the gains that were made by shit. I mean, Bitcoin made a 20x, which is huge in 2017. But when you look at like Ripple, when you look at other coins that like Ripple did like 100,000%, like a thousand X. <laughs> like, like if you bought Ripple at the start of, if you bought a thousand dollars with a Ripple in like January 2017, you would have had a million by, you know, January 2nd or 3rd, whatever it was, when it peaked in 2018. I mean, that's, Absolute insanity. Uh, 
So it'll be interesting to see if it holds. It's been holding 25 cents. We had that chart pulled open earlier. I'll pull it open. I know we're talking about shit coins here, but shit coins are fun. Like, they are fun. You can't. Um, They're fun because everybody gets to learn something. Like, we're going to be able to refer back to this episode or re refer back to just Ripple as an example of <laughs> remember crypto in 2017. I don't it, it probably won't be called crypto in a decade. People will laugh at us for saying crypto so often. Um, so I think re referring to this as crypto in 10 years old, it'll be funny. It'll be like calling the internet the, uh, the information superhighway. It'll be the same thing. The information superhighway for those that don't know was, uh, what people thought the internet would, or, you know, what was going to be the internet, which it obviously wasn't. And Bill Gates wrote a book. I think it was like something road in 1995, he released it or 94, um, with his, whatever they co-authored with someone. And the updated edition came out a year later. And it was funny. The first edition had like a handful of references to the internet and information. Super highway was referenced, I think like a hundred times plus. And the 1995 or 96 edition, the updated one referenced the internet vastly more hundreds of times or over a hundred and information superhighway was non-existent because there were a lot of people who thought this information superhighway like tvs whatever was going to be some big deal and it it you know it didn't it was the internet you know because people were scared of the internet. internet was this giant public thing and that's why we had all these you know companies that had their intranets intranets as in their private um like similar to like jpm coin their own private blockchain their own private intranet basically where you know your your company could communicate throughout each other, but they weren't exposed to the outside world because that was dangerous. Yeah, it's funny. I've actually um, I've wanted to talk about that. I want to do an episode on on the internet. I think that would be fun. I have a lot more homework to yeah. I have a lot of homework to do for that. Um, but on that same topic with Bill Gates, that was that was the whole thing. That was his bet, right? That you know the internet was just going to be one of many um, different technologies that could be used to send information from point A to point B and really hard for the, you know, these private intranets. And that's what they were really betting on. And Bill was wrong. And the next year he had to th throw in another chapter pretty much on the internet and how game changing it's going to be. Um, so a lot of people, every, it's hard to bet against open, open source, like, thinking that the private solutions are going to work and then be adopted and then you're still, and you're going to be able to charge on top of that just to use it. Um, yeah, it sounds great in theory. It's just not going to work. You're, you won't be able to compete with free open source software. And we're seeing that right now again. And that's why so many people who are, I don't know how to, if this is the right way to say it, who are in early on the internet are, it's like watching this, uh, you know, the sequel to this to to the movie, right? They they know exactly what's going to happen. They've seen this thing before. They know how it's going to play out, and um, they're betting on on Bitcoin, and uh, especially in today's like macroeconomic environment, it really makes sense to take a closer look at Bitcoin. And uh, the same people who were into the internet a long time ago are seeing the same thing happen now. Yeah, that, that was pretty funny. Um, the October 26, 1993 issue of New York Times, one of the technologies Vice President Al Gore is pushing is the information superhighway, which will link everyone at home or office to everything else. Movies and television shows, shopping services, electronic mall, and huge collections of data. LOL. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not really a big fan of Al Gore, but whatever. <laughs> no, I just I was just reading what uh, little Wikipedia think. That, that's why I mentioned it because it's Al Gore talking about the information superhighway, which he clearly I doubt he had any idea what internet or information superhighway was, but it was a big deal. That's no, all. are you kidding? He got a paper memo about it, probably. Like, yeah. really think about it. <laughs> he probably got a fax about it. <laughs> Seriously, I don't know. I mean, the whole thing's great. You couldn't have even imagined what the internet was going to be like Uber's just taking scale within the last few years. And, you know, we've had mainstream kind of internet usage for a long time now. Like look how long it takes. It took, I guess, for the internet to really catch its stride. Like you, you needed a lot of other things to happen first 
in order to enable the use case of Uber, right? Where you click a button and a car shows up and picks you up and takes you wherever you want to go. You know, a, a lot had to happen between AOL and Uber, right? And now it's not that, that much of a stretch to think like you're going to have your money on the internet too. And it's natively there and it works perfectly. Um, and that's what you, you have with Bitcoin. And the reason why fiat's so clunky is because it wasn't born like native of the internet, right? It was a it was a paper technology. And then they had to make it digital after the fact. Whereas, you know, Bitcoin's always been digital and it was made to be used in conjunction, you know, with the internet. Exactly. Um it's it's uh, I was gonna say the internet. I'm blanking on I had something good. Um <laughs> I hate when that happens. We can keep this in, I don't care. Uh you know, oh, the internet, um, one of the interesting things, oh, exactly, I know I was going to talk about market penetration. And when I mean market penetration, I'm talking about how many internet users were. The reason the dot-com bubble completely failed was there was no infrastructure. Very, I mean, it was small. You know, there was, it was, we were still 3G in terms of cell signal and whatnot. Or, yeah, 3G had just come out in early 2001, I think. Um, and so, like, and you got to think about it, it was dial-up or, you know, Wi-Fi was just coming out. I mean, and that's the reason all this majority of internet companies failed was because of market penetration. And we look at things like Snapchat, Instagram. The only reason they're able to fucking continue to go is because market penetration. You had like for instance for Snapchat to work, you needed not only the internet market penetration, but you needed smartphones. You needed a lot of smartphone users. No one uses would use Snapchat if there was only a hundred people with smartphones. It wouldn't exist. And the, you know the same thing goes with like Uber. Uber doesn't exist because you have. Uh, 4G LTE or whatever, you got Wi-Fi, um, and then on top of that, you have the ability to just communicate, you know, like that. Um, and it's kind of interesting when we're talking about, you know, Uber is getting pretty big, and like you obviously have Lyft, but then also like China's completely obviously blocked out Uber and made their clone copy. I think Diddy Chucks, and I think that's pretty funny. That's a, I think what Uber Lyft. I know we're going to be slowly moving on to this topic of public markets or markets, not public markets, but markets in general. Uber, Lyft, and Diddy Chucks, and they're all looking to IPO, and they're all valued in the billions, to the point where I think Uber's valuation last was like sixty-eight billion. Uh, uh, I have no idea. I thought I saw hundred billion, but it might have gotten moved up to hundred billion. I, I I don't know. That's going to be another. Hmm, I don't know. I'm curious to see how that plays out. Yeah, I see. My thoughts are like, especially where the markets right now. I for a company like that to go for seventy billion, you. Don't like just look at any IPO. I'm going to pull some IPO charts just, just to explain my point here, because every IPO for the most part of the past, not all of them, but a good chunk, especially in the past four or five years, have all been flops. Snap. Good snap. Nothing. Just dump. Continuous dump. Uh, blue aprons are perfect. Aprons my favorite. Aprons like the ultimate shitcoin chart. <laughs> Yeah, it's a mess. A complete mess. Um, let's look at uh, Spotify. Like Spot was a big deal. I remember when that happened. Like this this time last year, sometime like that. Yeah, happened in uh, April. Um, like it did pump a little bit, but it obviously dumped way down. Um, shit. I mean, it's like a majority of IPOs. Um, it just shows when we talk about we talked in other episodes. Free money creates the ability to. You know, basically zero percent interest rates allow you low money, create money. It makes money cheap, and malinvestment, as we talk about a lot, is what leads to these um, issues we see here. It's 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 a complete disaster because you get the, you get basically insiders just dumping their bags on mom and pa's head. You see it every time. Like Snapchat's IPO was so overhyped, so overhyped. It was insane. Yeah, and you. I wanted to touch on what you were talking about earlier on. Snap, because I I read a a tweet thread from uh from Beautyon, which pretty much used a similar analogy, and they were talking about how um for do you remember like getting pictures developed at a local like camera shop or at a CVS or whatever? Did or are you too young to remember that? I I remember that. All right, so he he was making the example that <laughs> places like that don't even exist anymore. And it would have you would have never thought that those kinds of businesses would ever have gone away. And if you were to pitch, you know, in the early '90s, um, 
a device to take pictures um, and it was, you know, the size of a s- smartphone that we know today and it would replace all of the, you know, the chemical imaging that we have to do um, to, to take photos. You know, you would and, and we're going to have a billion people using it. You would have been laughed out of the office. They would have said it's impossible. There's no way we can do it. And it it was right. It was the the Internet wasn't mainstream. You didn't have smartphones that were pretty much computers, cameras, all, you know, with the size of something you can hold in your hand and put in your pocket. It, it, you're right. That didn't make any sense at the time. But now all of those places are gone. There's a handful maybe in every city, maybe. Uh, and just like that, it was gone. So like a, a lot needs to happen for new kind of technologies to come to fruition. And it's really hard for us to imagine using a money that isn't uh, <laughs> declared legal tender from whatever um, government authority or country that you live in. That doesn't make any sense because we've never had that before. It, it, was, it seems like it's impossible. Yeah, and I so I pulled up the co- the Kodak Eastman Kodak Co um, chart here, and do you remember last year's little topic? But when Kodak announced their blockchain project, so like and they announced it literally peak crypto in January twenty eighteen, and it went up like it, I don't even know the percentages. It's something stupid. They went up like three hundred percent in like a week. You know, off the blockchain hype, they're like we're developing a blockchain incubator or something ridiculous, or blockchain photos or something. And look, I think they had mining rigs or something that they you were. You know what? You're right. I think but you're regardless, right. that's a great way to get out of your position at the. You know, <laughs> dude, look at the volume. Look at the volume. Five years, and then on one day, I'm just gonna see what. The... So. Yeah, but that's so interesting. That's one industry that Kodak pretty much created, right? Or if if I'm wrong on that, somebody send me a message and tell me that um, Kodak didn't bring uh, like chemical imaging. Uh, mainstream, but just like that, you saw the same thing with Blockbuster. Boom, gone. Gone because you, you, they didn't adapt. And, and they like, had the chance to buy out Netflix for like fifty million in the early two thousands. Like exactly. uh, Reed, what's his name? Reed, I can't remember his name. Who's the uh, Reed something? Is the CEO? Reed Hoffman? Who's the CEO of uh, Netflix? Something. Oh, 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 oh. I, I'm not sure. I don't know. Something. I, now I gotta look it up. Uh, but anyways, he he literally came to Blockbuster and they laughed him out of there. For fifty million dollars, Reed Hastings. <laughs> that was so and, funny. And and then w- within uh, like six years, Blockbuster was done. Like twenty eleven, and Blockbuster was done. Like I think the last Blockbuster just closed down recently in the past year. But like we look here, and just go back to Eastman Kodak. Eleven million shares are traded that week, and all the other previous weeks under a million shares. Besides, for leading basically up to the pump, which is insane. Right. Yeah, I mean that that that's wild. It's crazy that, you know, they've been completely, um, they're unnecessary now, but we have a device where there's more pictures being taken now more than ever, you know, trillions and trillions and trillions of photographs. So like the market's expanded and you've watched one company kind of wither away to nothing. So Mm -hmm. it makes you kind of question who is susceptible (laughs) to the same fate uh, as Bitcoin becomes more prevalent, it, you know, I, I don't know. Will we, will we look at physical banks, like building structures and be like, and you know, I'll tell my kids like, yeah, man, I used to have to go into there and they would give me paper money and they'll be like, what the, what the fuck are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, just like if I were to explain to them, yeah, when we got pictures taken, we had to take them to the store and get them developed on a piece of paper and it went into chemicals and then you could look at the picture. That's not going to make any sense to them. And it's not going to, they're not even going to have bank accounts most likely. So the whole, you know, they'll be driving around looking at bank of America buildings and, you know, they'll be converted into hopefully steakhouses or, you know, a burger joint. It, uh, that would be, guess, that, that's a world that I want to live in. <laughs> all I got to say is guess what uh, Codex market cap is. I have no idea. Less than Bitcoins for sure. <laughs> 132.88 million. <laughs> oh man, that's a shame. That's a shame. But oh well. Yeah. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, do we want to go into the uh, debt bubble we're talking about right now? Yeah, for sure. I think that's a good way to transition. Well, um, 
just we've seen some pretty good stuff in the market. Obviously, at least you I went off in US indices. Um, and I had I think I had the S and P open earlier. Has seriously we had basically a twenty percent rally in the span of sixty three trading days, roughly. Um, since the whatever, basically Steve Mnuchin, and you don't know Steve Mnuchin is Steve Mnuchin as the Secretary of Treasurer. Um, he called made that phone call uh, on that Christmas Eve, basically to the banks, or you know, right on Christmas Eve to the banks, asking if there are any issues. And at the as you can clearly see, we have rallied quite a bit since then. Um, and I'm gonna go a little technical analysis here. We got a very eerie Doji on the weekly here, um, and that's scary. And why is it scary? Because Doji means indecision, bearish Doji, I guess you could say. But it doesn't really matter. Doji's a Doji, uh, and that's scary. And um, for those like, if, you know, I occasionally dabble in stocks, but looking here, uh, I'm pulling up the daily chart. The only reason I pull up the daily chart is to show you the when it. So like a lot of times there's gaps, gap up, gap down. And towards the end of a rally, generally, there are exhausting gaps. And we've, we've seen the exhausting gap here the last few days. We saw this gap up here to 28.13. We went down, and then that last little exhausting gap up here. Um, that's generally the sign that, you know, the, the rally we have now is coming to an end. Now, if the gap was at the bottom, like somewhere here, like, a, you know, when something dumps and it gapped up, then that would be, you know, a breakout gap, basically. Um, and one thing with gaps, and, and if you don't know this about stock trading, well, because stocks generally gap more than anywhere else. Um, gaps almost always get filled. And so I saw some pretty good tweets, but like right here, 27.15, there's a gap. That's a pretty big gap. Um, there's another one down here somewhere that's pretty scary. I don't know where, but anyways, there's some gaps to be filled on the way down, and it's going to get very hairy soon. Um, I think I think it's over. I think March and April are going to fucking wreck us. Uh, beyond any belief, I mean, I'm, my thoughts are like 1800 spics or by spics, I mean S and P 500. Like I, I think this is a good area to go next, and it's going to happen in a like very short time frame. It's not going to be oh, it's going to take us six months to get down there. It might be a month and a half. It could be quicker. Who knows? Um, especially since all our markets are driven by algorithms, algos, and that's a very scary thought. Like in, in you ask, what do you mean? I'll show you an example of algos. Let's go to the one-minute chart. Um, the algos go nuts, especially at the end of the day. It's always funny. I sometimes watch the close in the one-minute just because it's funny watching. You know, we always have been pumping in the close, especially since the 24th December call from Steve Mnuchin, which is hilarious because um, if for those who don't know, Plunge Protection Team, PPT, was founded after – Ronald Reagan started it basically after the 1987 crash where the Dow Jones dropped 22% in a day, which – is an insane number one day. I mean, that's trillions of dollars just vaporized in thin air. Um, and I, my dad talked about like how he always wanted to, you know, you know, be a, be a guy in Wall Street, be in you know, markets. And he was, you know, in college, I think he was senior year. And that just absolutely, you know, crushed any, you know, at that point, banks, you know, trading firms weren't looking for anyone because they just got crushed. Uh, great example is the Wolf of Wall Street. If you've seen that movie, which I assume most people listening to this podcast probably have and where Matthew McConaughey's firm just, completely implodes, you know, one day. Um, and that's a scary thing. So not too long ago, uh, Jerome Powell had this famous quote, the U.S. federal government is on an unsustainable fiscal path by which it is meant debt as a percentage of GDP is growing and now growing sharply. Uh, and for those who don't know, Fed chair, Jerome Powell is the Fed chair, Federal Reserve chair. And what he means by that is... What's going on right now, and the problem is our media is so delusions. I'm not talk about America, but in general, media delusions. People, they're like, we joke about us hitting $22 trillion in debt. That's such an astronomical number. But what's even worse is when you include unfunded liabilities, that number goes up to $200 trillion. Soon we'll be talking about quadrillions, and it's, it's a scary thought. And the fact that people don't seem to care about it shows you how easy people are are focused on other things that don't matter. And I talk about this a lot. Like people are worried about the NFL. They're worried about NBA. They're worried about things that don't matter. And there's what really matters, what really affects you is monetary policy, foreign policy. What is your government doing? What is your government doing through money? What is the central bank doing through money? And the greatest example is inflation. Um, every day, you, your value, your, your, you know, the value of your money is being taken away from you. It's being stolen. Inflation is called the hidden tax for a reason. 
They don't have to tax you. They'll just print more fucking money. And guess what? Your money becomes worth less. And you lose money. That's as simple as that. And it's it is sad because, you know, that's why we see this huge fight over minimum wage. And I've talked about before probably on Twitter and Instagram. Is there's this huge fight over minimum wage. But it's a joke because, like, for instance, the, the dollar in terms of weight of grams of gold is, is down 75% since 2001. 75% since 2001. And gold's a perfect... That gold's like honestly one of the better gold silver, but gold's a great you know thing to see where the dollars went when you look at gold, um, and when you look how the dollars lost seventy five percent of its value in terms of gold since two thousand one. That's only eighteen years, eighteen years seventy five percent, and when we look at the U.S. dollar in terms of losing value since nineteen thirteen, it's estimated ninety six to ninety eight percent. It is very sad because we're fighting over the wrong thing when we see you know especially when we see people like Alexander. Uh, Casio Cortez or Bernie Sanders talk about socialism, universal basic income. It's unrealistic. You can't just print money just to print money. That's not how things work. You can't just give money away for free with no incentive because then things don't get made. That's how things get made with capitalism. We and if you read the Bitcoin Standard, Saifedean Amus talks about how the golden age of you know money was 1870 to 1914, where you know money was basically gold and silver too. And that it, it, money cross borders, no issue. Nowadays, if I want to go to Europe. Like if I'm going to, you know, anywhere in the EU, I need to get euros. They won't, they won't take my dollar generally. Um, when I, I want to go to Britain, I got to get pounds. If I go to Mexico, doesn't really matter. The dollar actually goes farther. Now, obviously, if you go to somewhere like Venezuela, you know, third world countries that you know have struggling with their currency, yeah, they're going to take dollars because dollars are going to hold their value compared to their currency. Um, and this is the big thing I talk about here. Is the, you, I'll pull up a gold chart. Uh, anything you want to add in here? No, but I wanted to mention that uh, I saw uh, talking about you know inflationary fiat shit coins. <laughs> Crypto graffiti was flying over to Venezuela, and he brought ninety pounds worth of bolivars with him. And there's like pictures of him being stopped <laughs> when he landed. Like pretty much, why the fuck do you have? 90 pounds worth of bolivars and the funny part is it was like the equivalent of a hundred us dollars or something yeah um i I don't know it's it's (laughs) if you think that can't happen in the country that you live in think again because it certainly can uh, because hyperinflation is unpredictable and you you never know when it's going to happen but there's been too many pictures that we've seen throughout history of you know people making (laughs) you know purses and wallets out of paper money or pushing them around in barrels or lighting them on fire because they're completely worthless. Um, and that, that's what's happened to all of the fiat currencies, but they're, they're still around for right now. So that, that's what makes all this really so exciting. Um, yeah, the, the, I think the greatest example of hyperinflation was when it was happening in the Weimar Republic, Germany, after World War One because of Basically, Germany and a bunch of other European countries dealing their currencies from gold to print money to fund that war. And that's why World War I was on such an unbelievable scale compared to um, any war previous to it. Central banks were printing money. And that's why when the U.S. was giving you know supplies, ammunition, equipment, etc. to countries in Europe fighting, they were only accepting gold because they knew these countries were printing their currencies to zero. Um, and obviously, certain countries experienced it worse. The hyperinflation was obviously much worse in Austria, Hungary, uh, Germany, especially post-war because all the blame was put in Germany, even though it wasn't Germany's fault. There's there's a long story behind World War One. I'm not going to go into it, but World War One didn't just happen because uh, Gabriel Princep shot the Archduke or Franz Ferdinand, Prince Franz Ferdinand, uh, and his wife. There's a lot more. There are people that wanted World War One to happen. Uh, if you really do the study, I really recommend looking to World War One because World War One has completely shaped everything we know today. Everything, the modern central bank, the the, the nation state. The, you know, people went from living with relatively little government influence in their life at all to government being pervading into every aspect of your life. Um, and we look at World War One. One of the interesting um, things I've seen before and really makes sense is Britain was the Britain was the you know superpower. It was Pax Britannia, which is you know basically British peace. What that means. Uh, and Britain ruled basically 1815, you know, global power, you know, to 1914. World War One destroyed their empire. I mean, and then there was some remnants left after, but World War Two ended that. And 
you look at uh, Pax Britannia and Britain, and when I was going back to it, Germany and Britain, Germany's GDP surpassed Britain's GDP in 1910. If you don't think that has to do anything with World War One, then you really need to take another look at what happened in World War One, why. Um, and when you look at World War One, World War One was a catalyst for World War Two. It set Hitler up for power. Why? Because Germany experienced hyperinflation bout from 19, what, basically post-war, 1919, 1923. Hitler ends up going to jail. That's where he writes Mein Kampf. The economy recovers with the Roaring Twenties. And then 1929 comes around, and voila, you have October 1929, the crash. And Hitler rises to power there because they're everywhere, everywhere, basically in the world, obviously, was decimated. Obviously, the U.S. went to the Great Depression. But there's a reason, like, Hitler got elected. When people get forced into such shitty economic times, they will grasp for anything. And that's why he was elected. It's that simple. Uh, it's it's sad to think about it, but this is why I really emphasize to anyone listening to this podcast, really study history. Really do. Don't just listen to, you know, a few things, you know, told you by mainstream sources. Really in-depth study. I, you know, whether it's books, you know, going on the internet, just do it. it you, you'd be surprised how much you can learn. And it really, it will, you will change your view, shape of the world, but it is worth it. It's worth understanding why things are the way they are instead of sticking your head in the sand. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I, uh, I agree with that advice. I didn't give a shit about history. I typically don't. Um, and I didn't care about it in high school or college learning about it. None of it made sense. Um, and you know what it, as it turns out, probably what I was being taught wasn't really very accurate anyway. So if you are listening to this now is as good a time as any to, um, <laughs> you know, do some real research on what actually happened throughout history. Cause it's going to be, uh, probably different from what you remember the story being when you learned about it in high school or college. It certainly was for me. And I didn't start learning about history until recently. And it was only really because of Bitcoin. So that's, uh, Bitcoin just really leads to more questions and more questions and you're looking for answers and they're in there. You just have to go look for them and, and you can get them from anybody. Everyone's willing to give you this information for free. You just have to go look for it. So I think that's really good advice. Um, I, I saw your Instagram story and I'm just, I thought it was pretty funny that tweet by Benjamin Wolf, and I'm just gonna quote it. I'm just gonna read it because I had something similar happen to me with a bank account that, like, I my I think my grandma gave uh, my brothers nice and money into this bank account. Like, you know, it was it's not a amount, of money box, nothing crazy. And like when I was, um, so I'm gonna read this tweet, but then I'll go on to that story. Uh, had fourteen hundred dollars sitting in a savings account with Wells Fargo since 97, 1997. Forget about it till now. They told me they don't have it. They closed it after two year inactivity. They told me the state has it. Called the state. They don't have it. And then, as you said, bank, don't worry. We'll hold it for you. Um, and all I got to say is, like, I had something similar to happen to me. Like, I went to go check the, the bank account. You know, it was, I think it was a savings account, with, like, the bank. And, like, the money had lost value. Like, they'd taken money away from me. And it was, like, my grandma, like, what the fuck? Like, I only had it for a few years. It wasn't, like, I had it for more than probably four years, five years, maybe a little more than that, six years at the time. And like I didn't touch it or anything because I just I had another I had another bank account that I used and it was back in high school. But like, it's absolutely insane that like you can't really trust your money at the banks. Like that just shows you, you just believing like if you leave some money in the bank, it might just disappear. Yeah, I mean that story. I had a number of people DM me that similar things have happened to them too, and that's kind of that's the whole reason why you'd put your money in a bank, right? Because it should be really safe there, and apparently it's not. Um, I think that's that's just so bullish for Bitcoin in general, but also makes you really – it'll make the, a normie sit and think if they were to see that. They'd be like, oh, well, that's weird you know, because I typically trust mm-hmm. my bank. Uh, and now I know <laughs> the Bitcoin that's uh, – the UTXO uh, that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping secure with my private keys – I know it's not going anywhere. It's going to be exactly the same. No one's going to move it unless I unless I I move it personally myself. Uh, and there's something really powerful about that. I'm sure it feels similar to somebody you know burying uh, cash or gold in the backyard or under their mattress or whatever. Um, I'm sure the feeling is um, kind of similar, but that that sucks. Like that that's the use case of a retail person using a bank is to secure your money. That that's really what it is, and that doesn't always happen. So, you know, 
I don't. I guess that's similar to investing in a shit coin and there being a backdoor into a wallet and getting your funds drained. It's pretty much the same exact thing. Um, <laughs> it's wild though. It's absolutely wild, and I hope more people think about it. And that's really even like censorship, financial censorship, like you see with Alex Jones or um, Jordan Peterson or something like that. Like that's so bullish for having an apolitical money. Um, that can't be taken from you. Yeah, and apolitical like social media or whatever, like Gab. Yeah, that, I don't know really yeah, much about Gab, really, and I think you neither know more do than I. I do. But you know, what? I want to I want to join it because I think it's important, and it's 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 just like what you're saying. You need that idea of an apolitical social media where like free speech actually exists, and you need free speech money, and that's what Gab says all the time. Bitcoin is free speech money, and it makes perfect sense for them because they couldn't get a bank account and had theirs. Uh, you know, issues with their with their banks and they used Bitcoin and it worked perfectly because that's exactly that is the use case. Mm -hmm. At the most basic fundamental level, like that's the use case. Someone you're a business that <laughs> people can't send you money to and you need a way to receive value and Bitcoin solves that problem perfectly, perfectly. That's, I, I don't know. I think that's super fucking dope, to be honest with you. Um, that's the ultimate use case. Exactly. Um, it's, it, you know, it, as we talk about privacy is very important. And, you know, one of the saddest things with the, internet, the rise of the internet is just people have literally been so abused and they're so, they're so unaware of how abused they've been by larger corporations with their data, using their data to, you know, profit from it. And not only that, but just, exposing people like the Equifax thing, like half of America was ex data, like, you know, social security number, phone numbers, email, their address, you know, everything was exposed. I mean, it, it's absolutely insane. Yeah. That was one of the, that is going to be, or was one of the hugest, um, insurance industry losses that we'll, we'll remember. And I have a feeling those, those cyber losses are going to get way bigger. And only then will we see people start taking their privacy more seriously. I think um, they need to feel it a little bit more. Like, yeah, sure, okay, you know, your identity gets stolen. Um, maybe you don't lose too much. Uh, your, your American Express or whoever has your back, they cover all the funds that were stolen, and, and that's that. But when you start seeing some more wacky shit start to happen regarding privacy and having your identity stolen or like deep fakes or something like that. That's when people are going to be like, all right, you know, this sucks. We get, I'm, I'm going to take my privacy more, more seriously. Exactly. It's uh, it's something you really have to take seriously. Like I've had, like, I think my dad gets credit card stolen and stuff like that. You just gotta be careful. Uh, you really do. Um, and that's why, like I, we mentioned before in podcast, I strongly urge everyone to use 2FA, which is two-factor authentication. Um, dual mobile app's pretty nice. There's other things called Authy. Uh, it's very simple. It's very easy. It's And the cost of privacy is just time. It's just like the same thing as storing crypto. But yeah, it takes a little more time, but it's important. Yeah, it's totally worth taking a half an hour and learning how to do it and getting used to it. It's at the end of you, you won't even realize you're using two FA after a while. It's, it's not a, it's not a huge deal to make the switch and it's definitely worth doing. Like you have to take your privacy seriously. It's for your own good and your own protection. Should we go into the, should we go to that tweet storm about the U S dollar or? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, the Brendan Bernstein one. Yeah. I have it pulled up right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you could, well, people are watching the video can read it, but his first tweet reads, the U.S. dollar is going to turn into monopoly money faster than people realize. People are starting to say deficits don't matter just as they matter more than ever. Owning a non-fiat store of value is more important than ever. In 2022, the government officially turns into a Ponzi. Here's why. And quickly saying, when he says owning a non-fiat store of value, that could be owning Bitcoin, that could be owning gold, silver, commodities, it could be owning real estate. Owning something that isn't a fiat currency, basically. Uh, and he goes on, debt and deficits are rising faster than ever. Deficits just surpassed $1 trillion. They are, they are not slowing down. The $20 trillion treasury market was $10 trillion treasury market a decade ago. So the, tr the, the market for U.S. treasuries, which basically we sell off to other countries and it's helped us suppress interest rates, has doubled in the past decade. And it's not doubled from like a billion to two billion. It's doubled from 10 to 20 trillion. 
There's a thousand billions in a trillion. There's a million millions in a trillion. Just sit down and think about that. A million millions. Like that's such an, like, here's a good example. Like when we think of a lot of numbers, like the University of Michigan football stadium is like one of the biggest stadiums uh, in terms of like in football. And it like what holds like a hundred thousand, the big house holds a hundred thousand people. That's a lot of people. Now, like when you think about a million people, like just imagine trying to think about a million people in front of you. That's a lot of things. Now just think about a million times a million. Um, and that's why I, my point is, it's like, so here it goes again. Real deficits are even worse. Boomers are retiring and entitlement spending is going through the roof. When you count all government liabilities, the real debt balance isn't 20 trillion. It's 10 times higher, 200 trillion. That was my point I made earlier. When you include unfunded liabilities, the picture gets a lot scarier. By 2022, real interest expense will surpass all tax receipts. This is historically when fiat currencies collapse. We'll need more debt just to fund existing debt. This is like rolling credit cards. And by rolling credit cards, it means like, you know, using credit card to roll to the next one, basically, to keep it going because you can't afford to make your interest payments or your principal payments. And then he goes on to say, who would loan us money? And that's a very good question. On um, Right now, if you're watching the YouTube one, you can see this chart here. But basically, we are at about, what is it, 97% of um, basically of existing debt. Um, in terms of funding it. And then he said, you can't finance new debt with existing debt forever because at some point the buyers run out. Foreigners, historically the largest buyers, realize this and they've stopped buying our treasuries as a result. The trade war, foreign sanctions, this is the cause. And a perfect example is Russia like, announced that they had dumped all their treasuries, I think in mid to late 2018, I want to say sometime in August, I read something about that. And that's a big deal. That just shows you like countries do not trust you know the US. And I don't blame them. You have a country that's $22 trillion in debt. China's forty trillion dollars in debt. China has massively—I mean, obviously, China's massively expanded the last thirty years. But the past decade, China went yeah, the decade. China went insane. They they used the ability of free money, because basically zero percent interest rates, to just throw shit ton of debt, build and construct things out of the world. And China's about to have basically their lost decade, like Japan had after um, the Nikkei two two five, which is the Nikkei two two five, hit you know its peak in nineteen eighty nine basically 1990, January, and since then has not seen that high. Um, and I'm mentioning this because what's going to happen with China is when that fucking debt bubble implodes, it's going to cause huge issues. You think about a, a communist-controlled state, you know, when their money implodes on their face, when this whole thing comes coming, crashing down, because everything right now is synced. Global economy is completely intertwined and synced. So, if, for instance, let's say Monday the S&P 500 drops 5%. Well, First of all, you probably the Asian market's going to open first. So if Asian markets drop 4%, you know, U.S. investors, U.S. markets, algos are going to be insane when they open. So the point is, is global markets are all synced now, which makes the any kind of economic crisis that much worse because it's driven by algorithms and not driven by people. Um, and going on with what Benjamin said, this is also coinciding with bipartisan, bipartisan support for the MNT, which is modern monetary theory, nonsense, and increased fiscal spending. 2008 was a socialist policy for bankers. The rest of the country wants a similar socialist policy. And with the likes of the rhetoric of Bernie and AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, they'll probably get it. Recently, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is what Green New Deal wants like $90 trillion plus dollars. Just, again, just some pie-in-the-sky number that they pick for whatever God reason, you know, oh, you know $90 trillion. Where are you going to get that $90 trillion from? We're going to go, is the U.S. going to have to go take over and invade every country in the world so we can get some resources? I mean, that's that's a real question. Um, and going on, uh, but by 2050, all of our tax receipts will be already going to boomers' entitlements. The U.S. government will just be one big machine made to finance the boomers' retirement. We don't have any room to add massive fiscal policy. That's a huge deal. Meanwhile, the impending social plans aren't going to be cheap. AOC's New Deal would cost us just $90 trillion. That's over four times our GDP because deficits don't matter, right? When It's actually $93 trillion for a Green New Deal. Uh, we're, not only going, we're not going to end up spending that, but you're going to, the point, you're going to get to the point. The only way to finance new spending will be the Fed balance sheet. And for those who don't know, Fed balance sheet has basically since 2008, was, I think it was $800 billion before the uh, crisis, the global financial crisis, 
it went from 800 billion to just over 4 trillion by 2015 2016 and then the fed uh you know cut that off basically and left it flat until recently when they've been selling treasuries and mbss which are mortgage backed securities back in the market which has thus allowed the rising of interest rates so basically the way they suppressed like the reason we had uh 25 basis point um fed funds rate and very low interest rates whether zero negative or just like a fraction of percent interest rates for the better part of the last decade has because has been because like for instance the federal reserve they have been buying um treasuries and buying up mortgage-backed securities suppressing interest rates well when they've been selling them that has allowed interest rates to start to rise and the problem is is when you, when you try to control the interest rates like um how the fed manipulates it it's an issue because we don't get you know real value of money they're suppressing it so what it allows is malinvestment as we talked about earlier going on um no institution or actually we're not going to end up spending but you, okay. no institutions are going to finance a debt given the credit risk the fed will be forced to and the holders of the currency will take the hit aka us according to ray dahlia if you don't know what ray dahlia is he's a famous investor um he's a founder of bridgewater associates you easily could have a 30 percent depreciation in the dollar through that period of time and he's completely right it happens as crypto human mentioned it happens a lot faster than you think remember this is all late cycle two the fed has already turned most of these dials we've been in qe qe novocaine for 10 years and for those who don't know qe means quantitative easing qt means quantitative tightening um and for instance the fed turned off qe but they've considered recently some fed members have considered we might have to turn qe back on again which is absolute insanity next crisis when we really need the monetary ammunition the most will be out of bullets can the fed soften the blow of the next collapse and historically as we've seen time and time again no matter how hard central banks try they can't stop the collapse modern monopoly mon monetary or money theory could work early cycle in a closed system but if there's exits neutral arbiter of value the market won't finance a government that can't bail itself out with more debt the scarce asset will offer better real returns think of a currency like equity in a nation the debt holders are more senior equity holders will be diluted to pay off them pay them off when people realize this they will rush into scarce assets and sell off the equity assets like btc and gold will skyrocket value and that is right um obviously hyperinflation like venezuela's current hy currency hyperinflation happens the cost of things just go through the roof um but this won't be gradual i think that it happens in a massive step function of value increased as confidence in fiat currency vanishes meaning if you're not in these assets before the move you're riding a sinking ship lower this all happening this is all happening right before our eyes populism modern money theory the nonsense and demographic ships the people running the presses aren't buying fiat currencies they're building a worthless rock or they're buying excuse me the people running the presses aren't buying fiat currencies they're buying a worthless rock and he means by that is central banks um have been going crazy for gold of the past decade stacking and stacking and same thing with jp morgan when you look at the depreciation of the price of silver jp morgan has been stacking silver and then it recently came out that JP Morgan had been manipulating, you know, precious metals like silver, palladium, gold, platinum, etc. I just clear as day, you know, they know what's really worth value. And central banks, you know, things don't move overnight, but they're smart and they move ahead of time. And they stack this stuff so when it does, when your fiat currency does experience hyperinflation, they already have their bags full of silver, gold, etc. Um, and then finally, he says, Brendan Bernstein says, just wait until they realize there's an even more scarce, unconfiscatable digital alternative that's better. And I hope you guys know what that means. That means Bitcoin. Yeah, this was the perfect <laughs> argument for, for Bitcoin, like right now today with everything that's going on. I mean, that gives you the investment theses for like an impending kind of global financial collapse. Like you'd want to hedge, right? Um, you can buy a worthless rock. Or Bitcoin, um, and I, I'm not recommending either. But it's something to really think about when the <laughs> when fiat is not scarce, right? The money fundamentally isn't, and then you have something that's like finite, right? 
arguably Bitcoin's one of the only, and time would be the only two finite things that you would have, right? You have a limited amount of time on the earth and there's only 21 million Bitcoins. Other than that, I'm sure we could figure out a way to get more gold and mine more of it. Um, and that's really powerful. And people will realize that eventually. And that's something that I think about often is when do people realize <laughs> how fucking wild like a truly scarce asset is. Um, and a, when I think about it even more, um, price is the only thing that's going to make people want to learn more about it. So, um, people are going to not have their bags packed when the train takes off, which is okay. Hopefully they can get on at another stop. But what, as the price continues to rise, they're going to do their research and scarcity is going to hit them. It's just going to slap them right in the face. And, and there you have it. That's how you create a bunch more Bitcoiners. Yep. It's, it's that simple. You create a, you know, people that realize that the currency is worthless. Yeah. But Brendan Bernstein is my boy. His, his, uh, tweet storms are legit. This was a really good one. I'm glad we talked about it. Um, we'll, uh, try to put the link of that in the show notes, but, um, yeah, that was, that was a pretty dope episode. I think we covered everything we wanted to talk about. Oh, wait, here's the, um, Here's the unicorn startup valuation I was talking about earlier. The total value of unicorns surpassed one trillion recently, but um, there's 325. And what I mean by, sorry, I don't going back to this, but I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, unicorn company is a private company valued at more than one billion dollars. Total number of unicorns right now is 325. Now obviously it's went crazy since the global financial crisis. This coincides with free money because people, you know, VCs, you know, basically funding with you know by using debt whatever to buy into these companies, etc. Um, the right now the highest valuation is to I can't pronounce it. Bite Dance is the it's a Chinese company, seventy five billion. Um, date joined and it joined that date in twenty seventeen. So it's went from one billion valuation in April of twenty seventeen to now in March of twenty nineteen seventy five billion. That's really impressive. Um, and it's located. It does digital media AI. And Uber's next, so Uber's is 72 billion. I saw that figure, but I didn't know if 68 billion or 72 was the right one. And so on demand is the industry. And that's the same thing. So Diddy Chucks and use China's Uber or Lyft, whatever you want to call it. And they're at $56 billion. And that's another on demand ride service. WeWork is the next one for the United States. And so it's pretty interesting. The majority of the, excuse me, unicorns are, I had a burp there for a second. Are either China, or U.S. I literally, you can scroll and list. Okay, look, look, Singapore. there's Bitmain. Look, look, oh. <laughs> Bitmain, which is hysterical. Um, I oh my god, I wish there were more blockchain startups on this list so we can watch them like there's go only, away. There's only one. That's so funny. I control but left. Yeah, I control left it. I only got one. Yeah, that's um, that's awesome. Yeah, Bitmain's gonna be the. First. I mean, management's changing over i don't know jihan Wu's not going to be there anymore that would be pretty helpful he uh really shit the bed there with the whole bcash stuff um <laughs> couldn't you consider yeah. coinbase a blockchain and it's just fintech oh yeah i mean it's definitely worth in the billion so i wouldn't i wouldn't be surprised if that i mean stripe tw <sighs> stripes 20 billion that's impressive yeah i mean and that's payments yeah it's, well payments is huge too that's why, like when they talk about yeah. like why like you know Cryptocurrencies like example Ripple, XLM, uh, Stellar, they're focused on payments. Um, it's tough, you know. The the reason they won't win out is what people will argue about, and I kind of agree with this. Is you already have so many payment things: Square, Venmo, you name it. Um, Zelle, all these banks are using Zelle now, so I can send money to like like I was with my buddy he was, like, a couple months ago. He was able to Zelle me like twenty bucks, like and that happened like that, and snap of my fingers. So. The point is, what's going to win out this whole crypto madness is the store of value use case. And that's where Bitcoin obviously wins because as you've discussed before, and I think we discussed it maybe on this podcast, the Lindy effect of, you know, longer currency has been around, the, le the more likely it's going to last longer, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that's a good point. The store of value use case is huge. I actually put that on my story the other day because I, I had saw somebody uh, tweeted about it and it it made perfect sense that don't underestimate the store of value use case. And I love when when people DM me and talk about, oh, it'll, it'll just be a store of value. Like that's a that's a bad thing. And <laughs> I mean, when you look at 
the market caps of stores of value. You have gold, which is seven trillion. You have Visa, which is in like the hundreds of billions. I mean, they don't even compare. And one's a payment infrastructure, the other's a store of value. And then you think about something like uh, the global real estate market, and that's something like two hundred trillion. And we know that um, high net worth individuals and even um, a middle class person stores their wealth in real estate. There's a ton of real estate investors. There's, a, I mean. I just sold my home last year and I made money. It was great. That really stored my wealth through time for five years until I sold it. Um, you have, I've heard of uh, real estate investors who are having a difficult time competing with investors from China because they're, uh, the, the return that they're looking for is break even. So they didn't even, they're not even worried about making money. They just know that their money is going to be worth way less if it's not moved into an asset that can store their value through time. So they're buying, you know, uh, Manhattan real estate or real estate in Toronto or, you know, whatever. But that's a huge market. Imagine if they had a digital asset that didn't cost very much to store. Um, they didn't have to fly all over the world to look at real estate and buy it. They could just <laughs> keep it on their phone or a multi-sig or in a, in a bunker somewhere and just store all of their their bitcoins or their wealth through time it's just so much easier than uh looking for a different store of value in something else because money is just supposed to be also a store of value as well so um looking for a store of value somewhere else is kind of tricky I don't know. it's a big market the store of value market is huge i think that's my point <laughs> like it's it, it's in the hundreds of trillions it's what looks like a lot <laughs> Huge market. <laughs> yeah. I think that's but, a good uh, way to wrap us up. Yeah, this is a good episode. So thank you guys for tuning in. Um, check us out on Instagram, Twitter. Please like and subscribe uh, this YouTube video if you're watching it on YouTube. Subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher. It's available on Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts. If you uh, like the show, please leave us a review and a rating. It um, It's super helpful for getting the podcast out. The best thing that you could do for us is if, if you liked it, share it with your friends, family, loved ones, whoever, um, uh, just to help get this out there. So thanks a lot. Yep.